Greetings, adventurers, and welcome back. It's been a while. In fact, the longest hiatus that Dark Dice has ever been on. Caitlin and I have been hard at work over the last few months, completing our first season of The White Vault Goshawk and wrapping up production on Don't Mind Sealskin Rock. We've also been hard at work on our adventure book, Unnatural Horrors, which has expanded the true necromancer class and our first adventure, Domain of the Nameless God, into almost 300 pages of content between those two books alone. We're not quite ready to kickstart it just yet, but you can follow our project on Kickstarter for updates once we go live. Over the air quotes break, we got a particularly punctuated review stating that we really need to wrap up old stories before moving on to new ones, and we couldn't agree more. So this season of Dark Dice, which starts now and ends in October, with new episodes airing almost every two weeks, we'll start with some Season 3 content before jumping into the much-promised return of Season 2, where we still have a lot of ground to cover. But I'm hopeful that we might just reach the end, or at least very close to the end of Season 2, before we hibernate for a few months to work on The White Vault Goshawk Season 2. Just a quick reminder that our production is fully fan-funded by you, dear listeners, so if you do enjoy what you hear, please consider supporting us on Patreon so we can continue to create as much Dark Dice as we can possibly handle as part of our yearly release schedule. Your help really does make a difference, even between seasons, as we use that time to build and prepare details like transcripts, music, and casting for the next batch of episodes. Well, enough of this shameless self-promotion. Let's jump right back into the thick of it and roll for initiative. Shalis de Pace. Salis. Do you seek him? 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 Do you seek the nameless god? You have found yourself among those who roll the dark dice. What you are about to hear happened long ago, a story brought back from the edge of oblivion, dutifully transcribed and enhanced orally to better captivate your attention. Previously, The crew and guests of the Willow's Wake had made it to the sunken bulwark, a barren rock inhabited only by the sunken faithful and the spirits of their faith. As Viviana saw that her friend was the intended sacrifice, she lit a fuse and drew her blades. Dark Dice, Shores of the Silver Thrum, Chapter 8, A Mother's Scorn. Viviana cuts the 18-second fuse in half with her dagger. I light the first one and roll it toward the middle of the room. When the explosion goes off, I run as fast as I can toward the burly priests holding Fluffy, and I'm going to slice the hell out of their ankles. Uh, Well, um, let's roll initiative. A loud clatter rung and echoed across the chamber as a small hissing tube bounced and rolled across the tide altar, replaced five seconds later by a blinding flash of light and a loud noise that disoriented all present, save for Viviana, Yara, and Lon. Fluffy the Owlbear screeched and hollered even more than before, its feet clawing into the stone floor, the priests attached by catch poles jostling back and forth under the creature's brute strength. While most within the room pushed and rushed to flee the Grand Temple, unsure of the nature of their unseen attacker, Lon and Viviana sped towards the larger priests who held Fluffy. Lon, using her rapidly sobering logic, threw her magical rope toward the closest priest in an effort to catch his legs. I rolled a one. But Lon misjudged the distance, throwing the magical rope past her intended target, briefly wrapping it around one of the appendages of the statues behind him as Viviana dashed forward towards a different priest, the one who directed the procession only moments before, slicing low and cutting his ankles for 16 damage. Hell yeah. Dude, I freaking kill him. <laughs> the priest's legs were literally cut out from under him as his blood spilled across this sacred and holy place. With its captors distracted, the owl bear lashed out with its full frustration, mauling the closest priest to death with its claws and beak digging into flesh before throwing another on his back and moving toward the center of the aisle. The congregation, in response, skirted away from the beast, at least those who were not still dazed. Shouts and screams created a chorus of panic, and from the leftmost hall, a sad and soulful crying briefly cut through the cacophony. But before anyone else could act, the sunken mother scowled and bellowed out in rage as she doubled in height and size, similarly to how Convo had a few nights before, directing her fury at the only creature that could be clearly implicated as responsible for the sacrilege, Lon. The fourth lead priest cast a blessing upon his allies. Yara had already begun to run out of the temple the moment the explosion happened, and he continues his departure. Pussy! Yara's a damn pussy. <laughs> <clears throat> Vin is going to follow suit. He's really confused as to what's happening and doesn't want any part of it. 22 on stealth. 
He's just gonna run straight out and back towards the ship. Then saw the opportunity to pull Yelena Av or the captain with him at the slight cost of speed. No, Vin can move faster on his own. Convo is quick to recover his sight and look to Captain Gelmain for direction. However, dazed as he was, Convo could only grab Gelmain and Av, pulling them toward the aisle, pushing random passers-by to clear a path, and making his dash action to approach Lon and Viviana. For fuck's sake. If it was the last thing he'd do, he'd make sure that they made it safely back to the Willow. I'm going to cast Thunder Wave at everyone in front of me. Nine damage. Heavenly Thighs, cast down your An explosion of sound left Lon's hands, amplifying her clap into a roar of thunder that shot a physical wave of sound and energy before her, casting one of the priests down into the tide altar and damaging the others with its power. The sunken mother felt the blast but remained standing. The screams of the fallen priest were lost within the waves in an instant. And now I'm going to run. Running within range of an enemy without disengaging would provoke an attack of opportunity, in this instance from the embiggened sunken mother. Yeah, I don't want to fight 40-plus cultists. The sunken mother swung with closed fists, hitting Lon in the lower back for 14 damage. I can't take it. I can't take it. As Viviana disengaged and moved toward the emotionally distressed Fluffy, Viviana rolled an amazing handle animal check as she approached. Shh! It's me! It's me! Remember? I bet you the weasel. I want to help you escape. Follow me this way. The owlbear looked around, distressed, seeing a sea of blue robes that she assumed were dangerous. But when she saw Viviana, remembered the way the tiefling smelled, she didn't lash out and moved with Viviana toward the main exit. Captain Gelmain, still dazed, was pulled by sea sorcerer Gallusk, who had begun to run through the aisle Convo had cleared back toward the exit. The numerous priests and the chaos of panicked guests split the Willow's Wake's crew as the sunken mother moved with purpose towards Lon. However, it was Convo who caught the sunken mother's gaze as he'd curiously run forward instead of away like the other guests. Fight someone tough, you pussy! Lon had the full attention of the sunken mother who now loomed over her. A single punch was thrown, and as the fist connected with Lon's chest, she was knocked unconscious, a crunch audible to those nearby. The last remaining lead priest worked frantically to stabilize the bleeding legs of his companion, crying through the futility and senseless violence wrought against their family. As some of the more physically capable faithful in blue robes began to move to defend the sunken mother, yet it was not her who needed their protection. And at that moment, a young man entered the temple, panting. Fire! Someone set fire to the ships! This messenger was clean-shaven and handsome with disheveled long hair and nice clothing, yet there was something familiar about his eyes, like a long-lost friend or acquaintance. But at his calling of fire, the priests and guests, fearful of further problems, weighed the validity of this messenger, who now required a deception check. Nineteen. And so, various ship captains, crew, and merchants added their own voices to the panic, second mate Av Mitov included, and began to rush toward the temple's exit. I said, fuck! Back to the willow! Convo, who had rushed toward the sunken mother and maintained her unflinching gaze even as Lon fell, quickly sought a way to sow confusion. Priestess, I saw more of them headed over there! And I point towards the western hallway with a 14 for deception. Bowery, check it out! No one leaves the bulwark until we've sorted this heresy! A small detachment of priests moved in that direction while the sunken mother lifted the unconscious body of Lon with barely contained malice over a toothy sneer. Fuck. Well, I guess I gotta do this. Convoy begins himself to giant size, rushes to take Lon from the sunken mother, and then dashes away towards the entrance with her under his arm. The sunken mother, furious at Convo's deception, swung at him with all her strength, trying to prevent the groaning orc's escape and catching him in the eye for 19 damage. As the eye swelled and turned a sickly blue, he saw stars briefly, his legs buckled, and he felt like his body just might give out. But just like moving through the high seas, he did not falter, willing one foot in front of the other as he pushed his way through the confused crowd. It was now time for Lan to make her first death saving throw. She needed to roll three successes before three failures, or she would die from the wounds she'd received. Nine. And her spirit began to move toward the light of Seligon as her grip on life weakened. Viviana, directing the owl bear, had reached the tideway, those slick rocks, as seawater splashed and spilled over the edges of its path, creating difficult terrain. Thusly, she was forced to reduce their speed to a cautious one to avoid any missteps that might cost them dearly. Back inside the sunken temple, a sound rung out over the chaos, a voice charged with magic echoing across the temple as one word influenced the minds of all within to quiet. Stop! This word was directed at Convo in particular to halt his movement, requiring a successful saving throw to avoid- Seventeen. Ah. And so Convo, almost double his original size, continued his sprint with Lon under one arm. 
Two of the stronger priests attempted to swing at them, one missing entirely after a last second shove from behind threw her off balance, the other hitting Convo but barely registering as the adrenaline kept the painted man in motion. As a reaction, Convo activated the glowing stone rune on his right arm, pointing back at the sunken mother, locking eyes and issuing a command of his own. You stop. She's gonna have to make a wisdom save, and uh, if she fails, she's gonna fall into a dreamy stupor. Yet she seemed unfazed, her righteous fury only growing with every breath. But the densely packed crowd made it difficult for her to keep up with Convo and Lon. The other elements of the Willow's Wake crew did their best to flee through the chaos. Closer to the exit, Gallus shot a chilled burst of magic wind, forcing a path through the sea of bodies they now stepped over, pulling the confused captain along by his collar while Av, who found an easier time keeping her wits about her than her superior, became lost in the crowd near the entrance. Like the other souls in the temple, they were now confused, terrified, and running for their lives, unsure of what had just happened, and if they would somehow be held responsible. But in that confusion, a friendly voice rang out, guiding the three of them toward the exit. Gallus, Av, this way! You all right? Is that you? As the sunken mother looked away from her dying brothers to the blasphemous cacophony that her ruined ceremony had become, she saw the perpetrators fleeing. Lon under his arm, Convo continued to run, and had almost reached the hallway that would mark them being free of this damned place. But the sunken mother would get one final attack. <laughs> Sensing her opportunity, she took drastic measures, throwing the large ceremonial silver basin across the room and catching Convo in the back for 12 damage with a crack reducing him to zero hit points, knocking him off his feet. All right, I go down to zero, but relentless endurance. Whenever I've reduced to zero, I go back to one, because I'm a work. Okay, wow. His will to live, stronger now than ever. Convo again defied the odds and found his footing, angled his head down, and charged through the throng, dashing past the entrance. He joined Av, Gelmain, Galask, and the Beardless Man as they fled across the Tide Altar, stumbling over rocks and passing the treacherous terrain as fast as they felt was feasible. Twice they tripped, and twice they almost fell into the sea, before reaching the main island of the Bulwark, increasing their pace as they saw the doors of Sorrow's Edge. Any inside who might have questioned Convo and his fleeing compatriots were still speechless, having just seen an owlbear barrel through. The captain and crew ran through cramped legs and burning lungs, they ran, though every muscle in their bodies cried out in protest. And as they ran past the docks, they could see that the Willow's Wake was in fact not on fire. Yet those aboard were making preparations at a breakneck speed to depart. Convo, First Gala, mate Lurs barked orders while Convo, looking to make the best of his last minute at this larger size, gently passed the unconscious lawn to Yara before departing to lower sails and help push off the dock. dock. If we don't leave, we die! Jetzt! Yara... Very untypically for him, because as we've learned, he's very by the book when it comes to orders and everything, ignores the first mate and carries Lan down into the hold, holding her as gently as possible, ignoring his aching limbs from the running and the pain in his side where he fell and just places her on the nicest bunk for now, the second bunk from the left, and looks to check her wounds, making a particular observation before frowning and just, just going back upstairs to help with the disembarkment. Yuahai, who was playing cards in the same room, watched Yara depart, unsure of what just happened, and, curious, followed the sounds of commotion coming from upstairs. Above deck, all hands were in motion, the captain himself piloting the ship as the navigator took a sword to a fussy line, while a throng of blue-robed priests carrying torches barely visible in the fog ran toward their slip. But even this was not the most confusing thing, as a full-sized owl bear stood on the deck, its back to the captain's quarters, haunches raised, quietly chittering and hissing in fear. As a tiefling woman that the others knew as Lady Viviana ran her fingers through the beast's feathers, soothing and quieting it. Shh! It's okay, it's okay! Uh, we're gonna get you some weasels or something. Just be calm. Um, excuse me, I'd like to take a moment to address, uh, what happened? Uh, uh, perhaps later then. Oh, and Vin grabs Yulhai's arm with meaningful yet compassionate strength. I think we'd best stay out of the way while they do whatever they're doing. Do you have a moment to speak? It's important. Sure. So, Yulhai, um... I need to tell you something. When you left us at the entrance of the cave, we... Uh, we did wind up exploring it, but there was a... Um, I can't call it an accident. Um, 
There was a wrongdoing. Something terrible. Uh, okay. W w w what is it? So, while we were trying to leave the cave, which was certainly a reckless and dangerous feat, even in the best of conditions, we were blindsided. And I need you to know that Ajay, he... he betrayed us. He, he cut our rope and, and killed Nimble. The fuck? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Nimble was my friend, too. I went back for him and tried to wake him up, but he was dead before I could even get to him. Ozzy looked down at me from above and just laughed. It was like, it was scary and, and, and demented. Then he just left me to die without a rope. And I guess he didn't think I'd survive the rising tides. God, it was just so dark and the currents were so powerful. That cave was underwater, actually under the water. I thought for sure we'd end up like the Selkie in your story, but I was able to climb out. But I'm sorry I couldn't take Nimble's body with... Well, how, how, how did he kill you? Why did he kill... That doesn't make sense. I'll explain why he killed Nimble, but I'm sorry. I'm so very, very sorry. The, the double fuck! You'll have to explain this again once we're clear of the bulwark. So, Yuhai, you heard... You heard... Ajay and Nimble talking in a language that we couldn't understand, correct? Just before we went into the cave? Y yes And? I always had suspicions of Ajay. And without giving you my entire life story, I think his magics may have had a role in my older brother's death. Apparently, Nimble had some insight on this. A way to confirm this using the divine conch. And Ajay was threatening him in that other language just before we got inside. As I mentioned, Ajay cast magics through Nimble and dropped me onto the rocks. And Vin takes this opportunity to peel apart the shade steel leaf armor to show Yulhai the bruising and gashes along his side, his fit but chiseled side, where the rocks bruised him after Ajay pushed him down. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty terrible. Yeah, so, Vin, that is an interesting story. But it might just be that, a story. I recall you saying that you would give your life for Nimble, for RJ, even though you apparently didn't really know them that well. You made that promise and now you're telling me? You're telling me that you never actually trusted RJ? Sounds a bit fishy. Yulhai, if you've known one thing about me, it's I've become the leader of my people not by choice. I was forced to step into a role after my brother died and... Since then, I've had the responsibility to protect the people around me and to do whatever I can to make sure that they are safe. I knew it would be more safe traveling with Ajay than going alone. That way, if it turned out that my suspicions were right and I was forced to act on them, that we could avoid a war with his people. So yes, I had my suspicions. He would always look at me funny or make weird comments that didn't fully add up. There's also a deeper meaning behind why I was always suspicious of Ashe, which I can get into at a later time, but right now, we don't have it. I just need you to know, you cannot trust him if he somehow made it back to the ship. Please, understand what I'm saying to be true. Frankly, I have my suspicions on both of you until I can discern the truth for myself. I cannot believe that Nimble is dead. I felt like... Perhaps he might have been. Uh, uh, he was my favorite out of the three of you, and he was the only one I really cared came back. He always had our backs, and he was... Yeah, and you did not have his back. When Ajay, if Ajay shows up, which I know he will, because he's alive out there somewhere, he'll do it with Nimble's knife. I saw him take it. And only Ajay would yield the knife of somebody he killed, because he is a hunter of the Sangoma, which anyone from the Blackstone Forest can tell you are a hunting people who are known to take trophies from their kills. He will have Nimble's knife as a... It, it's, it's sick to say it. It's immoral and unjust, but as a disgusting trophy from his latest kill. And if he shows up, you will see this knife, and that should assure you that what I've said has taken place. While this conversation was taking place, all aboard the Willow's Wake, who had escaped the last light ritual, were on deck, starting to finally recover, as Navigator Looper and Galisk worked to put as much distance as they could between the Willow and the Bulwark. 
Yara, his hair re-knotted and his fake beard returned to its place just beneath his nose, nuzzled Seely while eavesdropping on Vin's conversation. It was at this point that the captain moved to assemble a meeting. I need a head count. Who's unaccounted for? Arv, Lurz. Aye, Captain. Sir, I. We're missing Yelena and Becca. Gellis thinks he saw him in the temple right before everything went to shit. <sighs> Anyone else? Sir, uh, one of the guests, Nimble, has apparently been murdered. And also, we haven't seen the alleged murderer yet, Ajay. Damn. I told you this journey would bring ill tidings. Aye, Captain. So you said, I know, but now's not the time to panic. Nobody's panicking! Aye, sir. But we also have another matter to discuss in private. One of the premium passengers. What the deep hells is the Albert doing up on deck, Sans Cage? Shit! How's a loose Albert not our biggest problem? <laughs> Gallusk! Combo don't look too good. Give him a hand, bitter! I... <sighs> Yeah, so it's not easy being the only surviving deckhand. Combo is with Omen and with Uda, uh, trying to get the sails set at full speed. But I rolled a natural one, so it's pretty clear that the adrenaline is starting to die down and that his dexterity is slacking. He's trying his best, but he's just not up to the task. <sighs> Thanks, Gallus. Yeah, no problem. We should thank the gods, including the sunken one. That Looper knows how to navigate these rocks so well. Yeah, I, I, I can't believe Yelena and Becker are gone. I hate to say, best not dwell on it. But it seems our lot was responsible for the disruption of the ritual, and, and they'll be held to blame in our absence. Yeah, that could have been us if we were just a little bit slower. As Convo's mind returned to darker shores... Viviana required an animal handling check to see how well she and the owlbear had bonded now that the tense situation had concluded. I, I, got a, I got a 20. Okay. She had really bonded with Fluffy, who, having initially seen Viviana as the provider of food, had now calmed down back aboard the familiar smelling ship. So there's just this giant owlbear on the deck right now? Everything you wished for and more. <laughs> Fluffy had created a space for herself near the enclosed walls and overhanging wood of the forward quarter deck. Within these three walls of wood, she felt safe, almost as if she were within a nest, which she backed herself into. Oh, you're such a good girl, you know. Don't worry, I'm going to get you some fresh dead weasels in a bit. I just need you to stay here and just be a good girl, okay? And I give her little pets, you know? Having escaped to the open waters, the Willow's Wake was just beyond the immediate wrath of the sunken faith. However, a murderer walked free among them on the ship, and there was still at least one more victim in his sights. Dark Dice, Shores of the Silver Thrum, Chapter 8, A Mother's Scorn, created by Travis Vengroff and K.A. Stats, featuring Lily Pichu as Viviana Bloodchamber, Eric Nelson as Vind Graveview, Jasper William Cartwright as Ajay Ogun, Florian Zeitler as Yara, Enrique Perez as Convo, Sophie Yang as Lan, Sam Yao as Yuahai, K.A. Stats and Travis Vengroff as co-dungeon masters. Featuring the voices of Lonnie Manila, Clara Skiprick, Ryan Philbrook, David Amber Devereaux, Jack Fallahi, Kira Baxendale, and Kareem Cromfley. This episode was produced and edited with sound design by Travis Vengroff, with dialogue editing assistance by Kayla Shu, mixing and mastering by Marissa Ewing, transcriptions by Shian Francois, and executive producers Dennis Greenhill, Carol Vengroff, AJ Punkin, and Michael Villegas. This episode features music by David Wise, Ryan McQuinn, Enzo Pazovio, Atoshi Sakamoto, Stephen Malin, Brandon Boone, and Travis Vengroff. To support this production and get ad-free access to bonus releases, music, world lore, art, and early access to future adventures and DD materials, please join our Patreon at patreon.com/foolandscholar. This is a Fool and Scholar production. Thank you for listening.